Good morning, I'm Teresa Rush, editor of Arable Farming Magazine and head of Arable Content for CropTech and Farmers Guardian. Welcome back to the final day of the CropTech 2020 show, where each day we've been bringing you a fantastic seminar program. We've welcomed a great selection of industry experts who've been offering specialist insight into the latest developments affecting the arable sector and asking what's on the horizon for farmers. Our final live seminar will begin shortly, but first, here's a brief overview of what else the event has to offer. Our CropTech virtual event platform is designed to help you get the most out of the show. Down the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see a menu of options, and one of the best places to start is with the virtual exhibition hall. From there, you can navigate around the interactive map to virtually visit the stands of more than 40 exhibitors. To enter their stands, simply click on the company icons and you'll be taken into their individual areas. Each exhibitor area is packed with relevant company and product and launch information, videos and contact details. You can do some virtual networking by requesting live chat with company representatives. Back at our main menu, you'll find a navigation button to our sponsor hubs, which this year are sponsored by Horsch, UPL and Yen. Each hub features a comprehensive on-demand seminar program, which you can watch at a time that's convenient for you. Finally, to find out more about what's coming up over the next three days and learn about our speakers, click the seminar program button. We would encourage you to take the time to have a good look around the site and take advantage of the opportunities to speak to people who have made themselves available. Enjoy the show. We'll be starting today's seminar very soon, but first, here's a short film from our digital sponsor, Adama. Alongside increased regulatory restrictions, single-site fungicides have another growing challenge. When used repeatedly, they have an increased risk of resistance. And while mixing single-site chemistries can lower the risk of resistance, even then, parallel mutations might happen, compromising the long-term efficacy of single-site fungicides. So, how can we future-proof disease control in cereal crops and optimise the efficacy of single-site actives? The answer is fungicides containing Folpet, powered by MSI Protec. While single-site fungicides use one pathway and have an increased risk for resistance, MSI Protec's multi-site chemistry is low risk and acts on three biochemical pathways, reducing mitochondrial energy production, cell division and inhibiting spore germination. Folpet, powered by MSI Protec, is the only multi-site active proven to prolong the life of single-site actives by helping prevent resistance, keeping single-site actives effective longer, with a doubling of life expectancy possible. And with effective long-term disease control comes maximised yields and maximised profits. To add Folpet, powered by MSI Protec, to your disease control programme, visit adama.com or speak with your Adama contact today. And now I'm delighted to welcome today's host for the Crop Protection Seminar, Caroline Drummond. Caroline, as most of you will know, is Chief Executive of LEAF. Good morning, Caroline, and welcome to CropTech. Well, thank you, Teresa, and what an exciting two days it's been. I'm delighted to be joining you today for the final instalment of this year's virtual seminar programme brought to you by the CropTech Show. Today, we will hear from three industry experts who will take a practical look at how farmers can adapt their toolkit to improve productivity and enhance environmental protection in an evolving era of crop protection. These presentations will be followed by a Q&A discussion. Remember, there will be an opportunity for you at home to get involved throughout the session by posting your questions into the bar on the right-hand side of the screen, where all the speakers and I will be waiting eagerly at our keyboards to post answers. Of course, we know the huge challenges for us in terms of as an industry facing crop health around climate change, biosecurity, pesticide availability, the legislation, the physical act, the pesticides being physically there, resistance challenges, and of course, the opportunity, and of course, potentially compromising food security. But there are also opportunities. 
For us at LEAF, integrated farm management has been a core mantra for us over the last 30 years. And of course, integrated pest management is a key part of that. Indeed, 52% of LEAF Mark certified businesses carry out all eight aspects of best practice integrated pest management. And indeed, earlier this year, we launched one of a new series of Simply Sustainable uh, activities for LEAF, which was Simply Sustainable Integrated Pest Management, which is really available. But of course, today, now is the opportunity to really hear from our experts. We're going to be joined by three. Really pleased to welcome Murray Smedley, Managing Director of Barkwith Associates, Theresa Meadows, the Knowledge Exchange Manager at AHDB, and Harry Fordham, Syngenta New Farming Technologies Lead. Firstly, Murray Smedley, the Managing Director of Barkwith Associates. Murray started with Barkwith back in 2002, and his team provides expert knowledge and regulatory support to agrochemical manufacturers in the UK and elsewhere. The team also prepare product dossiers and defend their evaluation both in the UK and throughout Europe. Welcome, Murray. So uh, thank you very much, Caroline, for your kind introduction. Um, I was delighted to be given the opportunity by, crop tech, by the CropTech team to talk today. Uh, and I've obviously been given quite a, a, a wide topic uh, titled Changing Time for Crop Protection, uh, something I've, I feel is quite suited perhaps to my experience. However, uh, with the question set, I see this perhaps rather more challenging than I might have first thought. I have arranged my talk in into four questions, which I will discuss in turn. Uh, some of these may be covered by other presenters on the, on the, the day. Uh, by no means uh, could I claim to have all the answers, indeed, if any such exist. Uh, my aim is to provide a mix, mix of the current UK Great Britain positions, which are, which are really included in questions one and two, uh, with draft legislation now prepared for parliamentary approval, and more of an opinion when we consider the impact of these within questions uh, three and four. Uh, predicting, predicting the future, perhaps not considered a sensible career choice, but without further ado, let's begin. Uh, Great Britain has to diverge outside of the EU system. We simply cannot remain part of the plant protection product regulation, uh, even if we choose, uh, which, uh, as I mentioned in my previous slide, is indeed a proposal of the government to effectively copy the entire current PPPR legislation, and it's due for, for parliamentary review and therefore entry into Great British law um, on or around the 31st of December. Um, so, so I, I take the uh, I, I've taken some 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 points for, 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 from the draft legislation and from HSE's guidelines. You can see at the bottom of the slide there the reference I've taken. So, the first the first uh, point I, I raise here is that everything approved will continue to do so, as you can see from the slide there. Uh, that will certainly be useful for supporting industry and growers in the medium and sh short term. And the second point I mean, we have here um, sounds absolutely fantastic. Uh, we have uh, potentially an extra three years of, of products to be existing in the marketplace as the extension to active supplements renewals that were due to expire um, will actually continue while the UK authority uh, considers how they may want to uh, evaluate them. Um, this, unfortunately, is likely to lead to, with some divergence at EU timeframes uh, and, and quite a few uncertainties that will, that will um, certainly follow uh, for product evaluation. Perhaps there is an opportunity for, for the UK to become, become somewhat of a dumping ground for old EU pesticides that may no longer be approved in the EU, in the EU system. There's this, the uh, same data equals the same process. The point I have, I, I, I have here, um, will, will the same data and the same process mean the same outcome? Maybe not. Perhaps the same time frame, perhaps a duplication of costs. Um, the timetable to bring new products to market may be different from that within the EU. Um, that that is likely to cause some problems, I think, with harmonisation across our largest export market. Um, the final point in, the, in this section of the slide is Great Britain can, if it chooses, to allow to follow the continuation of sales of pesticides that are disallowed elsewhere and, and may provide a quicker route to market for novel, natural or more safer substances. Or it could demand stricter assessments and greater restrictions. Um, 
so 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 my con- conclusion to this part uh, I, I would perhaps can HSE the controlling authority provide increased efficiency and timeliness to evaluations and indeed to final decisions the, these the, these points have all plagued the EU system for many years uh, however uh, what might be the additional cost place on products to put them into the GB market can in can industry justified by this you might be careful uh, for what you wish for uh, my final note in this slide of course is that under the Northern, the Northern Irish protocol at the time of this presentation Nor- Northern Ireland will stay entirely within the jurisdiction of plant protection product regulations uh, in the EU hence the uh, uh, references to my slides are to Great Britain rather than the UK so on to question two um, Will the UK continue to abide by the precautionary principle of regulation? Um, this raises at the eyebrows of many in the industry who see the precautionary principle as being obstructive, uh, overtly cautious and unrealistic, or losing the point of providing affordable food, uh, whilst also uh, reducing our impact on the environment. Um, so I'd like to start really to run through the principles themselves. They're on the slide here. Uh, they're hidden away in the bowels of the Commission, never to be mentioned in today's sound bites of five-minute news feeds. Um, I might also mention these are also, these, these are applied to all chemicals, not simply those used in plant protection. Um, however, as we can see in this slide, although we might not, not agree with some of the conclusions that are made within the precautionary principles, the processes are based upon sound scientific principle and uh, of logic. So how could Great Britain arrive at differing conclusions to those of the, of the EU? In this slide here, I, I've suggested some, some ideas where we could maintain the precautionary principle. It seems very difficult that we couldn't, uh, but how we might end up with, with the more practical solutions for, for, you, for, for growers in Great Britain going forward. Um, we, could reduce the risk by, we could reduce the risk of exposure uh, by, by, by increased controls or refinement. Uh, the industry, agricultural practices have many of them now, but we could perhaps reduce the risk further. Uh, we could increase the endpoints. We, we can make, make, make the endpoints higher. We can interpret uh, differently what is harmful uh, and what can or cannot be justified. However, of course, there are always two sides to any interpretation. Um, those uh, of the opinion of, in defending conventional food production may not match those supporting organic agriculture. Uh, the impact and the opinion of the non-governmental organisations from all sides uh, will no doubt continue to hold very much political weight. In, in continuing to abide by the precautionary principles, which will certainly apply in the short term, as we have basically cut and pasted the EU regulation, could Great Britain ever arrive at, at any alternative conclusions to the EU? This requires perhaps a high degree of joined up science and thinking, which I might suggest appears to have eluded representative governments alike so far. Question three, what impact will this have on farmers on the ground? Uh, I have my crystal ball now at the ready. Great Britain has the opportunity to score some political points for its, for its growers, but we must be wary, of course, that there is all, all sides to an argument. Uh, so we could look at options like less restriction, perhaps, on use of affected products. But I can say to metaldehyde are two that spring to mind that are currently uh, a, a very popular topics of conversation. Continued and secure supply of pesticides. Plant protection product for the UK only would, would require commercial justification of the cost to place them on the market, uh, even with a lighter touch, whatever that might mean. Such costs have never before been placed upon Great Britain, uh, so we have no examples to reference or compare against. Um, a fairer playing field on a global scale. Uh, the EU process is already very divergent. Disagreements and differing of opinions between member states are often seen to be politically motivated. Extracting ourselves from this wooden theory remove the problem that we currently see. Outside of the EU, controls of pesticides very involve widely differing processes and in many case outcomes. Uh, acceptability of pesticide residues in food for export or import markets. Uh, concern for all import and export markets. Maximum residue levels are used as a trading tool to restrict and audit for correct uses of approved pesticide, both for internal markets within the EU currently and also for imported goods, e.g. EG, EG from the USA. Uh, after the 31st of December, Great Britain will currently be considered a third country. So on to my final question of my presentation, which is what are the new, what new plant protection products are there on the horizon to combat these challenges? 
Uh, perhaps the most expansive question of all. So I, I really split it into uh, um, three alternatives to new molecules, which I, I will go through now. Um, so uh, the first slide here, new molecules. Uh, I think it's important that we are aware that the vast cost uh, uh, to actually uh, uh, um, generate and launch a new active substance on the market. Uh, the European Crop Protection Agency considers um, somewhere around £2,000 million and 10 years to launch a new active substance. Only one in 140,000 molecules uh, go through a successful screening process to be launched on the market. There has to be some other routes uh, available to support growers in the uh, uh, in safe and cost-effective food production. Uh, I've outlined three alternatives in the following slides uh, um, to to, uh, to 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 factor against the ever decreasing pool of new molecules. I hope some of these will be discussed in the question and answer session later. But for, for existing molecules, uh, is, is there any opportunity to use these further? Uh, we see at the moment, in, in, certainly in 2018, over 80% of all uh, conventional pesticides uh, sold by value were of generic or off-patent sources. So these are existing molecules, the old chemistry. Um, uh, uh, the manufacturers, the supporters have been, very, have been, have been able to uh, increase efficacy, uh, lower doses, and indeed increase combinations of old active substances to make them more effective and safer. And the difficulty they have, perhaps, though, is, is in compliance with the uh, hurdles of re-registration. Um, precision application, I know this is going to be discussed later in the in today's session. Uh, it's certainly an offer, offer opportunity for lower doses and non-target, uh, reducing non-target target exposures. Uh, there may be some practical difficulties in applying this commercially to the larger scale broad, broad field crops. Um, and but for my final slide, alternative, genetic manipulation, biopesticide and IPM, biostimulant, there's many options that uh, we have in our toolkit that perhaps we need to bring to the fore um, to allow us to continue uh, producing safe food effectively. So my final slide today uh, is a quote from uh, Dr. Carl Segan. We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology uh, and yet have cleverly arranged things. And so almost no one understands science and tech. Thank you very much for my presentation. I'll hand you back to Caroline now. Right. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Teresa Meadows, the Knowledge Exchange Manager at AHDB. Teresa is responsible for AHDB's knowledge exchange activities in cereals and oilseed across East Anglia. She's also studying at the moment for an Uffield scholarship, looking internationally at best practice and methods that will allow for the widespread adoption of integrated pest management in the arable sector. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, Teresa. Over to you. Thank you very much, Caroline. I'm delighted to be here and part of this session um, to talk about such an important element of our farming industry that's only going to increase in importance as we go forward. And I'm here with two hats on today talking about the adoption and implementation of integrated pest management. As Caroline has said, we're looking at this upscale of this across the industry going forward. Many of us doing it already, but how can we make that a routine thing that we all do and we all think of at the forefront of our minds? AHDB is looking at writing its new strategy and integrated pest management is going to be a key part of that. And alongside that, my Nuffield Scholarship is taking me around the world in a virtual format at the moment to have to look at practitioners, at farmers and growers and how they've adopted integrated pest management the barriers and the successes that that's enabled. So if we look at how we adopt and how we implement integrated pest management on farm and the pyramid of integrated pest management, and I ask you, where do you start on this um, triangle in a routine? Is it at the top? Is it somewhere in the middle or is it at the bottom? And it might be different for the different things that you're doing, possibly with black grass now very much starting at the bottom, maybe with fungicides, maybe straight in at the top. Sarah Field, who works in New Zealand with pasture pests, has got a fantastic phrase of cryptic IPM, 
which she understands is farmers practicing all the different elements of integrated pest management, perhaps not that these elements are integrated into a cohesive approach. And particularly for her with pasture pests um, that New Zealand struggles with, it's not too it's not until they're too late and the impacts of those pests are being found, the significant economic thresholds are that IPM is then being thought about. Perhaps that's the same in our arable sector, and certainly I can think of a few things that will challenge that thinking in the same way now. So as we look to go forward and to increase that uptake of integrated pest management, what are the barriers that we're facing? And it's some of these I'm going to talk through with you today. Is it knowledge? Is it the incentives that we have? Is it the time to do the monitoring or to spend in the field to learn what we're doing to a subtly different and new approach as we go forward? So we'll talk through a few of those different areas. The first being the strategy that we do. It's been really interesting to talk to those in the horse sector, how rather than designing their programmes as a, maybe an insecticide programme for the year or a fungicide programme, theirs is more an integrated pest management programme. And that's at the fore. That's the language, the terminology that's used. If we start out looking at an integrated pest management programme, does that then change the mindset that we look at? And as Murray's already mentioned, that use of biological and to a large extent cultural control approaches is much more widely available in some of the other sectors. Can we use that and can we introduce maybe some more of these um, approaches to be used, particularly in our arable sector and um, where they're not widely practised at the moment, but it enables a move away from some of the harder chemistry? If we take that further forward and look at risk management, which I firmly believe plays a strong role in the adoption of integrated pest management, pictured here is Andrew Watson, a cotton grower in Australia. Andrew has found a way to accept the risk that he has on his farm by introducing a wide variety of features in the landscape and in the field to grow his cotton towards integrated management and um, pest management approaches. He has got shelter belts, native trees, is introducing um, insects now with drones across the field, um, predatory beneficials um, for the insect pests that he's got. He's moved from an industry where they were spraying three to four times a year to only having sprayed the farm once since 2007 um, to manage those pests. What's fascinating when you talk to Andrew, it's the detail actually that he's going into and the love of what he's doing that brings it all together. Not only is he going out once a week to look at the plants in the field, to look at the cotton, to look at the development, but also monitoring the pests and the beneficials, graphing that up, and then can monitor the pests as they rise, the beneficials as they then come and overtake, and use that knowledge season on season to do that monitoring as we go forward. Risk management, though, is a tricky thing. If we talk up to that um, about that to agronomists, how does that work? And that dynamic between it, how is different, that kind of do we need to look at the sharing of that um, responsibility in a greater way as we go through it forward and that dynamic. Not only that, but Roma Gwynn, um, well known in the horticulture sector, actually states that it's less about efficacy that growers are concerned about and more about reliability. And actually, as we move towards this new approach that's not out of a can, how can we guarantee that reliability? Talking to Darren Schwerz, a uh, um, leek and um, horticulture grower down in the south of Australia, he came about, he was spraying um, out for thrips and then noticed the two spotted mites that he had in the field. He decided that he was sick of going out for spraying for something, finding something else and going to spray something else. So worked with his entomologist, Paul Horn, who tried to reduce the sprays. And he said to Darren, why don't you give it a go? Darren took a, a fish tank, put some, planted some leeks up in it, took a grow light and then introduced some of the mites, two spotted mites from the field. He then took six predatory nut mites and introduced them into that tank as well. Within a few days, the levels of mites um, had decreased. Within um, two weeks, those mites had gone completely. And that was sufficient for Darren then to implement that across the farm. And now they're now doing that on a, an amazing level um, in integrated pest management. It is the language we use and the training that we have um, what's holding us back. The terminology that we all use, the key terms, um, is different potentially for different sectors, what we understand maybe from the arable sector, what's understood in the horticulture sector. 
talking to Vinod, who runs the Plant Wise program across Nepal and Asia, which is pictured here. They have a very clear stages. Stage one is their plant clinics, which happen on the ground for their plant doctors, very much at the farmer level, um, to come along and do much like our agronomy of today, um, to diagnose and to work out a way to treat that system. At the second level, there's a knowledge bank, that weight of evidence, that resource that sits behind it that helps those plant doctors um, design the integrated pest management approaches that shares that knowledge from across the sectors and indeed around the world. And then their stage three is looking at the monitoring and evaluation in order to allow for that continuous improvement, in order to allow for new pests as they come in and the benefits from that. Is that potentially what we need to rather than our fragmented landscape to have that clear, concise, consistent elements? And that's certainly something that AHDB is looking at developing as part of the new strategy. But perhaps it's the timing as well. Talking to Ant Siraj from Fargro, the application of their products that they make, the biological products, some of their growers used to just shake out those products across um, their area, their glass houses, their greenhouses. Once they'd had the training and actually thought about the approach they were taking and the different areas that they were using, found out it was much more worthwhile to spread those more evenly and rather to shake out generally to tap those um, products out on the plant because the understanding of the life cycles, the understanding of that knowledge has started. They are further down the line in terms of integrated pest management, but is it building up this kind of concept, this knowledge bank, and is it training that's important and um, for us all to get there? We're all learning. And then we think about the incentives. Is that policy um, for far growth, for horticulture growers, integrated pest management for all of us is the first line of defence when you're talking about sustainable use directive. The new EU farm to fork strategy that I'm sure Murray can talk about more, which we've heard very little about, I'd say, in the UK, is asking for serious um, reductions in the use of pesticides. Is it that you can access a premium or a market um, with your product? For Zespri and the introduction of their programme for kiwi fruit in New Zealand, it was the access to markets across the world that encouraged the starting of that. For the British Cotton, for the Better Cotton Initiative that's pictured here, that runs all over the world, this is a financial incentive to take a part. And indeed, Levi's are asking for 75% of their cotton from across the world become, coming up to the Better Cotton Initiative standard next year. Andrew Watson, when talking about my BMP, the Better Cotton Initiative approach in Australia, said that they were getting a dollar a bale as a premium for their cotton produced to an integrated pest management standard. For him, the derive for adoption was that there needed to be money involved, if only a little bit, to get you started. For them, the $1 a bale taken up by another commercial organisation allowed for a $3 a bale incentive. For them, a lot of them as a 10,000 bale grower, that was a significant way to get started on the integrated pest management approach. But talking to many others in the horticulture sector, it's that allowance of not using a, a hard chemistry, the soft chemistry, the biological approaches, the improvement that that has for operator safety and the environmental benefits that's seen. The sheer joy of beneficial insects are cool from Andrew, from Darren, from seeing um, the fields come alive with the beneficials and seeing that pest rise and seeing those beneficials take it on. It's not just that though, is it perception within our industry? and something that AHDB are looking at in terms of our reputation going forward. For me, this is a real challenge for, for cotton, for kiwi fruit, for leeks. The, the link between that grower and their consumer is very clear. For us growing wheat or barley or all seed rape as a commodity, what will that consumer be prepared to pay for in the future? Nikki Rust has just been doing some really interesting work at Newcastle University and one of her stats here is that 62% of the public would prefer to have farms with a mixture of food and environmental benefits rather than just food or the environment that those farms are working towards. Is managing integrate what well, is using integrated pest management on our farms the way to, to work and to be able to communicate that with our consumers? But for our commodity crops, are, you, are they prepared to pay for it? 
So the widespread adoption of integrated pest management is a continuous approach. Many of us are doing it, many of us are on the start, but is there a need for further integration? Can we pick up on the increased need for training? Can we have those robust tools that are there so we can ensure that products are both reliable and efficient and that us as farmers and growers, agronomists and as the industry are prepared to use them? What incentives do we need to look at and then that could take us along the way? Is that policy? Is that a premium? Is that just that we can have market access or that our farms and our wider environment must offer benefit? We're just at the start of this in terms of AHDB and our strategy. And we're at the, I'm at the start of my Nuffield journey, having talked to inspirational people from around the world. We look forward to hearing your feedback and doing, ensuring the success of this, that we could be using integrated pest management every day, routinely at the fore of what we're doing in the future. Thank you so much, Teresa. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, what a shame you've not had the opportunity to travel overseas beyond our field, but I think you've probably actually managed to get behind the scenes in a lot more places. So uh, at least there's always some, some silver linings in all of these opportunities that arise and challenges that arise in front of us all. Um, but lots more questions definitely to come as a result of that. And it now gives me a great pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Harry Fordham, the Syngenta New Farming Technologies Lead. Harry is the lead both here in the UK and Northwest Europe, committed to enhancing crop protection and farm productivity through greater precision decision making. The overriding aim is to fully utilize new technologies to better deliver the right product in the right place at the right time for the most effective results. Harry's role includes trialing, evaluating and interpreting all available technologies at the earliest opportunity to deeply understand their implication and options for growers and agronomists. So thank you very much, Harry, and over to you. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks, uh, Teresa and Murray. That was uh, some really, really cool stuff. Very interesting to hear about regulatory framework and, and integrated pest management that Teresa's been looking at. Now, obviously, I work for Syngenta, which is a, a crop protection product manufacturer, and uh, and we're looking at the best way that we can advise growers and agronomists and operators to use our products and to ensure that products get used safely, effectively and efficiently. As we know, there's many challenges facing the agricultural industry of today. Uh, there's a massive focus from consumers uh, and at the end of the day, they are our customers on where their food comes from, how it's produced, the quality of this food being increasingly important. However, they're expecting all of these things, but with food prices to remain relatively static. This is a fine balance for growers and uh, agronomists and managers to innovate in their production techniques and management of their produce. Uh, whilst ensuring customers and consumers are happy with the produ produce they're receiving. So we can help using data and digital tools to ha help farmers produce more efficient, better crops, and ultimately, at the end, become more profitable. As we've seen recently in, a, in the recent Arable Farming magazine, there's been a massive focus on digital solutions to aid with decision making and in the end, help with sustainable farm businesses. And we've all heard the, the, the big figures of we need to be able to feed 9 billion people by 2050. And as an industry, this is a high focus and a huge focus for all of us. Not just that, but also in the UK and the EU, we're going to have to produce all this food and not gain any land to do it with. We, in, in some respects, we might even lose some land. As a result, productivity may have to go up, as it has done historically. However, as we know, this can't be at any cost. And we need to think about the environment and the effect that we're all having on the environment. Regulatory and environmental legislation is becoming ever more a factor in our lives in agriculture. We're well aware of current changes in uh, environmental regulations, along with the fact that we have lost many go-to reliable products, chlorothalonil, diquat, and various triazoles, just to, just to name but a few. Um, the regulatory environment has moved from a hazard to a risk-based system. This gives us challenges, but also some opportunities. We can rethink how we apply current products, how we apply old products. And actually, 
when we're thinking about new products, we can rethink how these are registered and to ensure that these get used uh, accurately and efficiently. Farming is becoming more and more unpredictable. And the last couple of autumns and summers and springs have given us great examples of the weather just not playing ball. And if we can use data to help predict, for example, when weeds may emerge or when disease comes into the crop, and so that you can use your pro uh, products more targetedly, that's got to be a benefit for everyone. And we can do that and model these things using uh, plant protection products uh, for the future. Not only that, but we've got to bear in mind that consumers are telling us they want less plant protection products to be used on their food. The EU would like a reduction in uh, these products of 50% by 2030. And obviously, at Syngenta, this is something we can't ignore. You know, this is a, a very pertinent point. Going forwards, when we launch new products, whether it's uh, crop protection products or seeds, we want to make sure that their potential is maximized. And so that when our growers and our customers are using these products, they are using them to the best of their ability, whilst also using them responsibly. And we can do that by maybe when we launch these new products, use digital technology, data and algorithms that we have on all these products to ensure that when you, the grower, use them, they get the best out of it. So I've broken my presentation down into sort of three sections. I've got the future, the near future and things we can use now and, and how that can help growers in, in the present day to, to uh, get better results from using our products. So in the future, uh, consumer interest in where their food comes from is growing and it's growing rapidly. Buying locally sourced food is ever more important. And as we've all experienced recently during the recent COVID lockdown, uh, part one, should we say now, uh, farm shops were in great demand and local food was really, really popular. However, as we know, this isn't always popular. For, we can't grow avocados in the UK, nor can we supply asparagus in December. However, traceability of food is really important. And in China, Syngenta have combined with uh, local supermarkets to provide reliable and successful traceability using blockchain technology of strawberries. So in the table at the top there, you can see what we use is uh, a QR code on the packet uh, on the punnet of strawberries. And the customer can take a picture with their phone and it can tell them uh, where it got packed, where it got distributed, uh, where it got picked, and when it got picked, and the exact polytunnel it was picked in. And that's really, really cool technology. And that's stuff that I think there would be a great demand for uh, from our, our customers at the end of the day. One of the challenges we all have in digital technology and agriculture is getting different machines to talk to each other. And that's one thing that uh, we consistently hear from customers and consistently hear from agronomists as well. And ideally, what we would like to do is make sure everything goes up into a cloud, it talks to each other, it talks to the farm management system, and the recommendation goes straight to the machine and it just works. That's one thing we would love to happen. So we've combined with uh, Bosch, among other partners, um, to create this Nev Nevernext system. Uh, and the Nevernext system allows all the machines on a farm to be integrated. It can use cloud-based software, but it can also use one plug. And I know that sounds really straightforward, but it's really useful for our growers to be able to plug one machine into one tractor. And not only that, it can use the data from that machine, i.e. Uh, the fuel usage, for example, or how uh, tough the soil is, uh, if there are any compaction issues, and also using sensing technology to look at crop health as well. And all centralize that to ensure that we get the best possible recommendation. Moving on from that, work we're doing currently uh, with colleagues in Europe is whereby we can we can give you a, a product and we can sell you products and we can give recommendations for those products. So you would have seen in the UK, we've done low, slow covered, talking about integrating the best possible pre-em uh, protocols. But how do we take any uh, potential problematic issues out of that? We can do this system whereby, for example, we can put a QR code on the product uh, the grower or operator can take a picture of that QR code and that can then be sent into the farm management system. The stock is automatically uh, adjusted as a result. 
They know what product's going in the sprayer. The farm management system can use the cloud to then talk to the sprayer, tell the sprayer what product's in there. And if there's any uh, environmental uh, regulations, i.e. it has to be sprayed with 90% drift reduction, four-star, three-star Lirat rated nozzles, or if there's any buffer zone uh, restrictions, and then it can automatically put that into the sprayer. So for example, if it has to use a three-star Lirat rated nozzle, it will ensure that the operator gets a warning when the pressure gets too close to that three-star Lirat rating. And then we go on to the near future. As mentioned uh, before, the EU would like us to reduce uh, plant protection products by up to 50% by 2030. There's a, a further need for potentially organic growing uh, as well. And so what we can use is sensors that we've got currently available to precision apply products. And what we do at the moment is, for example, if we have a small issue on a, in a field, be it weeds or disease, we, uh, we don't put a sticky plaster over that bit of disease. What we do is we essentially mummify the whole field because we spray the whole field. What we can do now with using pulse width modulation technology and accurate sensors is uh, ensure that when the product's applied, it's applied accurately and to the problem area. And now maximizing efficiency on a farm is one of the highest priorities for any farmer or farm manager. Ensuring that the job's done uh, effectively and efficiently is the best possible way to maximize profitability for these farm businesses. If I could tell you that we had a system that could predict septoria infection up with, up to, with, with high levels of accuracy, uh, but also tell you how long a certain product is going to last in certain given situations so that instead of uh, prophylactically spraying, we can spray when we need to. And then also we can spray when that product's run out to keep the protection in there. So, for example, it would potentially do away with the need for something like a T0, T1, T2, T3 timing. You would actually go, the Septoria coming in next week, I'll spray. And then I know that products last for three weeks or four weeks or whatever it might be in this current weather circumstance, and then I'll spray again. And then we can use digital tools and agronomy-driven data to, to drive decision-making. And that's great. We've got all these tools I've talked about, which are seem quite a long way away. But now, what have we got available to us now at, from Syngenta? To ensure our products are applied direct, uh, correctly and effectively and responsibly, Syngenta do a lot of work on application. And that's one of my biggest uh, passions in, in my job is application technology, nozzle technology, uh, and how to apply products correctly. And we've recently released a, an app that's free to download off the iOS store or, uh, or Android store, which is Spray Assist. And let's see what that does. And it, it might not be as positive as it sounds, as you have me in your pocket. So I can give you... Uh, a nozzle recommendation not over the phone, but what this spray assist app can do is look at the weather in your situation and different, and you can save different locations. It can then uh, you put input what job you would like to do, be it pre-emergence herbicides, post-emergence herbicides, whatever it may be on, on a variety of crops from cereals through to veg. And it will then recommend the best water volume, best forward speed and best nozzle to use for that product in that situation. Also, you know, one thing that growers consistently say to me, which is a, a real bugbear, is, is calculating buffer zones. And as you know, buffer zones are really tricky to calculate because we have uh, varying buffer zones for varying products. We've got a, a mapping piece of software with some French co colleagues called Qualicible, and that can look at uh, potential watercourses near where you're spraying and tell you what the buffer zone would be with that product. And so that's a, and it makes calculating product usage and uh, area to spray much more straightforward. And then finally, we have uh, a new uh, digital platform called Protector. This is a new digital offering from Syngenta. It allows growers and agronomists to tell the story in their, of their fields in their own way. So they can customize as much data uh, as they would like. So you can do mapping to get uh disease scores or weed scores um, and you can count for beneficial uh, pests as well as uh, you know uh, non-beneficial organisms we can do worm counts and all this kind of stuff and you can record them geolocate it with your phone and save it using both a, an app on your phone and uh, a desktop computer um, 
all these insights will allow us to give sensible, good recommendations uh, for those fields. And it's got integration with John Deere to produce variable rate application maps. Um, and it can overlay these application maps and yield maps from uh, from cradle to grave, essentially, as soon as you start drilling that field to as soon as you start harvesting. So in conclusion, we've got a lot of challenges facing us, and I think it's fair to say that what we want to do is ensure that growers uh, get the most efficient they can in their businesses to increase profitability, use our products sensibly, and use our products responsibly and get the best out of it. This helps uh, our growers, but it also helps consumers know that when they're buying British, few, British products, uh, they know they're getting the best possible produce available. I've shown you lots of stuff that Syngenta are looking at in the future. I've shown you some things that Syngenta are looking at now. Um, and it's a really exciting space to be in because, as I said before, all these challenges that we've got definitely breed opportunity. And I think that's something we need to grasp and, and a chance that we can uh, change how we look at using plant protection products for the, for the future and actually forever. Wow, what a lineup we've had from our three speakers. Uh, very much looking at the legislation and the framework and opportunities in that space, integrated pest management, and then, of course, the whiz-whiz technology and data opportunities for much more effective precision farming. So I think we're now going to have all our speakers back together. I'm going to start off with some questions now uh, in terms of really trying to, to dig a little bit deeper into some of the issues you raise. And I'm, I'm going to just uh, pick up um, Murray on one of the areas that you talked about, which I'd also like to bring you in on this one, Harry, as well, um, about the precautionary principle. And uh, you put in one or two quite provocative uh, statements in your talk. Um, you know, is this something that the UK will stick with? And in addition to that, uh, of course, one of the things that has increasingly been looked at at an EU level is the innovation principle, which you didn't talk about. Uh, and so I'd, I'd like to just kind of unpick a little bit more whether you think there is real opportunity here to start not only looking at um, addressing the right products and the legislation for the right products, but perhaps expand the opportunity for new innovation to ensure that we can embrace that going forward as well. Murray. Uh, Caroline, thank you. Um, yes, indeed, the precautionary principle, uh, hopefully my slide uh, provided some some useful background for, for, uh, for the guests and for the audience we have today to really see that it is based on a, a, a reasonable scientific uh, logical process. So I think it would be wrong to, to just... Uh, dismiss it as being obstructive and awkward. Um, so given the principle is there, the UK is, or, or Great Britain, is going to adopt the, 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 the EU PPPR, including the, the, the basis of the precautionary principle, um, then I think we do have to look outside the box a bit and, and say, you know, can we change the, uh, as I put in my slide, can we change some of the factors that allow us to be more pragmatic about the use of pesticides? Or do we have to accept that, the principle is a sound scientific process. We, want, we might not like the outcomes, but, but, but nevertheless, it is a process where, where we can't deny them. Um, so, yes, do we have to look at our new methods of uh, food, food, uh, food, food production and crop protection and actually make sure that we include the basis and the uh, evaluations on these principles uh, right from the start when looking at new molecules, uh, when looking at uh, new ways to reduce the risk to, 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 to mankind and to the environment with, with, with existing molecules. Thank you. Uh, Harry, and, and just to bring in the innovation principle as well, because, I mean, you've obviously talked a lot about technology and that technology is it's going to be in the chemistry, it's going to be in the digital aspects, but also potentially in some of the breeding, the plant breeding as well. Yeah, exactly, Caroline. I think it's it's really it's really cool stuff because uh, it's you know turning our business round is is like trying to turn around a frigate at times. It's a big business. It takes time to make sure that people start thinking about things differently. And having the regulatory framework that we've got now 
is ensuring that we have to do that. And like I said, we can't ignore the fact that um, the EU would like us to use less product. Uh, and as a result, what we can do is look at, uh, like I said, to ensure that we use the products correctly, but actually, uh, can we stop the need for the product in the first place? So we're looking at uh, different um, plant breeding circumstances, for example, you know, on the on the on the horizon in Syngenta, we've got hybrid wheat. So this this is follows on from stuff like hybrid barley, where you can help with the yield plateau, but also actually, uh, it's easier to breed in certain traits. So. Uh, with the loss of neonicotinoids and the loss of um, or increasing resistance, should we say, in certain uh, pests, incre uh, breeding stuff in like BYDV resistance is brilliant. And that's a great start into uh, using less product or using product more accurately. And one thing I thought that Teresa said that was really interesting was uh, growers aren't necessarily uh, interested in efficacy. They're interested in reliability. And the best way to get great reliability is have a, a variety that is resistant to uh, certain diseases or certain um, pests. And I think that gives us a really good opportunity to do that. And it, there's certainly these sorts of things are, are, well, there's certain varieties available now, but when, when hybrid wheat comes, we've got great opportunities to uh, breed those traits into varieties more straightforwardly. Mm, thank you. Teresa, thank you. I mean, you, you talked a lot about risk, uh, and in particular, um, not only the sort of the risk of the consumer, but I, I'd like to come back uh, in, in, a, in a few minutes around that, but the risk for the farmer. At the end of the day, the farmer is having to manage a lot of things, that constant juggling everyday decisions. So how do you feel that those, particularly the cotton farmer that you were talking about, um, how do you feel those farmers are really trying to address risk reduction? I think, I think it's that, as we always say, um, it's that attention to detail isn't it? and that focus on what you're trying to achieve and the outcome at the end of the day. Talking to Andrew and Darren and many of the other people I've spoken to, it's it's that attention and that I guess that knowledge of, of what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. Andrew, like I said, was going out um, monitoring both his pests and his beneficials, knowing what they're looking for on a routine basis that he could a was able to kind of manage that pest um, increase and then know that that beneficial level was going to come in. Both Andrew and Darren you know, said again and again, you know, actually people around me were saying, well, you should be spraying, you know, the levels are going up. And they're like, no, I trust in what's going to happen. And I trust in that natural environment. And I think, you know, to get that trust that involves the understanding of what you're doing and what you're looking at, and the proving convincing yourself that that's the way forward. And I think, you know, potentially with some of the chemistry we've been using now, actually the trust is in that can um, and it's in that kind of thing. You know, if you go and spray um, something, you're going to have the effect that you do. Whereas if you're managing those natural processes, it will have an effect. What was interesting talking to Andrew was that they have had to spray and they have had a bad year where actually the integrated pest management approach didn't work. And for him, it was kind of, I had an interesting conversation about understanding that you know there are levels in some of these things and talking to the kiwi growers they've got the biological approaches and that works for some of the pests um darren was talking about having a uh, cos lettuce that was um enclosed and actually the insects were getting in the middle and so actually using the biological approach they were doing was hard because the consumer didn't want pests flying around in their um, lettuce when it arrived on the shelf so it it what what's interesting is doing it for each of those doing it for the consumer that you're going and and knowing that the kind of level of detail um yourself and what you're trying to achieve yes and, and i and i think we we see this with the leaf demonstration farms with particularly with um the as you you were alluding to the the protected horticulture piece where you know integrated mm -hmm. pest management has been their sort of raison d'etre for the last since 1956 pretty well and uh, yeah. it, it is, as you say, all about the skill at the end of the day. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, I was talking to one of our farmers the other day and he said, yeah, you know, we are introducing the pest at a manageable level to ensure that we can then control it at a manageable level. And I think yeah. this element is something that's very, very key. And, 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 and Harry, I mean, you, you talked about risk as well. So I think a lot of the tools, particularly 
some of the current tools that you're using even even now that are available it is about that a better management and attention to detail yeah exactly caroline and i think um just building a little bit on what Teresa said is is there isn't necessarily one answer fits all adaptability is what breeds a good farm manager and a good farm business and and adaptability helps you mitigate those risks and i think for example our spray assist app is a great example yes we would love to go spraying in perfect conditions all the time but as we've seen this autumn it seems to have rained almost every day and when it's not raining it's been blowing a hooli so you know we need to be able to mitigate that and by doing that, we can use technology, accurate weather forecasting, uh, nozzle technology to ensure that when products are applied, they're applied correctly. Also, when we're thinking about um, forecasting for potentially disease or the, the scouting that I was talking about, that is all just to allow vision uh, to the grower and agronomist of uh, issues they may have in their field. And these are issues that may crop up. They're issues that they may not have even realized are there. And that all helps to mitigate the risk of uh, losing yield, losing profitability, and at the end of the day, uh, not having a sustainable business. Mm. I, I, I love the way you say accurate weather forecasting. Um, how, how close <laughs> are we in terms of really getting some good, accurate weather forcasting? Oh, yeah. How long is a piece you, of string? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gosh, if only I could... Uh, if only I did have Murray's crystal ball. Um, I think it, it's really tricky because we're looking at different things with different weather forecasts. And I know that's a really pernickety uh, comment. But for example, the Met Office, when they deliver their weather forecast and the wind speeds, their wind speeds are taking at 10 metres above ground level. So for a spray boom operating at 50 centimetres above the target, that's not it's not comparing like with like. And as a result, our... Um, wind levels in spray assist app that's taken a, a meter above the, the ground um and it's 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 tricky to get very accurate weather forecasts and what we found is we've got our own weather system a syngenta weather system we have contrasted that with commercial weather systems and try to find as close a uh, accurate hybrid as we can and that's what we use is it always perfect unfortunately not but <laughs> The feedback we've got is it's it's pretty pretty good, and as we all know, growers and farmers, weather is a slight obsession for them. And I've know I've got friends who have got fourteen, fifteen apps all looking at weather, and they all seem to think ours is relatively accurate. But will will we ever get it completely right? I doubt it. No, but as you say, there's there's certainly a lot more sort of almost like personalised prescriptions, really, uh, for, for each field. And, and the very fact now, of course, the precision capability is sort of down to the size of a 50p, pen, uh, 50p yeah. pence, a 50p coin in a field is, is actually quite encouraging. So, yeah, no, yeah thank you. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the affordability, these, that's, that's often the blocker with these things is it, you can you can almost make anything you like. You know, you can have a camera in the in the space that can pick out one wheat plant in a field. But if it costs £100 per plant to do that, people aren't going to do it. Likewise, uh, with the weather systems we're talking about, they're now becoming more affordable and more more user friendly. And and they start somewhere and they're difficult initially. But once that affordability comes through and the usability comes through, the, the wide scale use will, will become better and more integrated. So thank you for that. Murray, I mean, in terms of some of the areas that you talked about, um, again, I mean, you were actually quite provocative in one or two of your, your suggestions uh, in response to your question. Uh, I, I don't know you, I haven't met you before, but lovely to meet you. And I, and I think you raised some really interesting okay. perspectives uh, because there's sort of the whole area of, you know, what's the impact going to be to farmers? And it is about risk, but also obviously, you know, could there be freer regulation? Um, and you talked about, you know, maybe less restriction on glyphosate and metaldehyde. Um, would we accept residue levels uh, in food at piles? Maybe I, I, I misinterpreted you, but, you know, how do you think this will realistically kind of fall with your crystal ball in this whole area? Because from a public perception point of view, I, I would have thought those are <laughs> high risk 
strategy. Can I? Yes, indeed. Uh, I hopefully my, my slide. I was trying to give uh, uh, both sides of the fence uh, a, fa a fair view, uh, a fair comment. Um, so certainly, uh, I suppose from uh, a conventional agriculturalist perspective, we, we like to see the opportunity that uh, an independent, uh, a great British regulation will, will, would, would allow these. Some of the things that I've suggested could be of interest. Um, however, we absolutely must be ensure must ensure that we continue to remain at all times very aware of the impact of conventional agriculture uh, on human health and into the envir environment at large. So uh, I hopefully was able to, to sort of put together both sides of the argument there. Um, so the UK or Great Britain in its legislation has the opportunity to, 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 to really uh, and decide more, more on its future. Whether that's going to be substantially different to what to, to how it has been planned and what happens in the EU now, I, I'm not so sure. I think back to my other slides and the comments on the precautionary principle, there is a scientific way. Uh, and, and despite the fact there is lots of nuances that we are, are f f frustrated by from a regulatory perspective within the EU scheme, um, it, it's perhaps not... Um, it's perhaps difficult to see how the, the how great how 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 any national British legislation could diverge from that to any significant degree. So uh, yes, there is a good and bad point to all of that, uh, but I but I think the scientific principle must remain, and I'm sure all sides of the of, of the fence would like to make sure that they are kept as they are now. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I, I, I would totally agree. But I think one of the challenges is even science is not a true science. So, uh, because if you look at from a farming perspective, if you thought, right, we're just going to hone in on the control of one insect and not account for some of the other aspects in terms of the ecology, the profitability, not to mention uh, plant health and capability on a, a productivity piece, that's the challenge because at the end, a farmer has to take a, a, well, they have to make a judgment call every single day. And that's where, you know, what is a true science piece perhaps could occasionally be lost. What's your sort of feeling in that particular area? Exactly, Caroline. Yeah, yes, exactly, Caroline. I think uh, the problem we've got more science is more equals more opinion, uh, equals more conclusion, perhaps. So although, as Harry alluded to, the, the, the technology is available to growers now to extremely fine-tune uh, um, what they're applying, when they're applying it, how they're applying it, and Theresa mentioned that as well, integrating all those uh, um, new technologies to be as precise and effective as possible. We still have this enormous uh, um, volume of scientific information, uh, and as you say, I quite agree, some of it may be very well uh, um, reviewed and recognised and understood, some may not. Um, I think perhaps we can look at the current situation and why we're here uh, having our virtual crop tech event as to uh, do the politicians listen to the scientists? Do the scientists give the same opinion all the time? Uh, there is yes and no answer to all of those questions. Mm. Yeah, no, definitely. There will always be some trade-offs in there occasionally as well, which is uh, the challenge. No, thank you. Um, just sort of go back in terms of, um, Harry, you mentioned about affordability. And uh, Theresa, when you were talking uh, about what were the incentives, you know, why are arable farmers in particular not taking up integrated pest management strategies much more? And, you know, yes, it's some, of it, some of it's the tools, some of it's, it's the risk area. But actually also in there, sometimes it's also, you, I mean, you mentioned about the marketplace. But, you know, and farmers need to have the dollars or the pounds to really get started. I think that was your quote from, from Andrew or Andy, Andy. But actually, there are some financial benefits from doing it right in the field. And one would hope that there are longer term financial benefits because of the climate change mitigation opportunities as well. Have you explored that in a little bit more detail? I think I'm at the start of the process of doing that and I think it's an area that I'd like to look in detail and I've um, been in discussion, kind of started the discussions, A, in terms of retailers and what they'd kind of be prepared to pay and if there is, a, I've had a few examples of people that have tried to put a logo on something to say it's been integrated pest managemently produced 
um, but it hasn't necessarily got very far. Um, I think, like you say, you know, and, and Leaf would be a great example of it, some of the benefits like many of the things we're looking at at the moment whether it's organic matter or soil health or things they're hard to quantify and they're hard to put you know a pound sign again but actually for the future and being more sustainable and farming more sustainably and um, there is the benefit certainly you know Andrew was very keen that you know he was very business driven and he was very keen that using an integrated pounds management approach wasn't going to have a detriment on his yield or his profitability and actually the two could go hand in hand and Darren was was again you know the same this and talking to a lot of horticulture growers even the the wider benefits of operator safety you know making a better environment by using the approach you know they're hard to quantify they're not necessarily going to return the yield but but they are future-proofing that business. So, yeah, definitely wider ones. What What is interesting is there are so many examples of, of where a premium has been kind of driving it. Um, you know, there's um, for rice, for cotton, for kiwi fruit, for, you know, all sorts of things, um, for kind of some of the protected um, plants. Is there that opportunity within wheat and barley or seed rape? I tend to think, as Harry and Murray have mentioned, our drivers might be more likely to be policy kind of personal willingness to to engage in these features for for future proofing it, like you say. I mean, from a, a leaf mark perspective, uh, I would say mm -hmm. that there are certainly premium opportunities and also preferred supplier opportunities, and we've mm -hmm. we've seen that definitely in the oil seed rape sector and to a certain degree yeah. in the wheat sector as well on flour. So I think the market opportunities are there. And, and I think that's uh, the great opportunity going forward is it's not going to be single policy perspectives that we're going to be facing. But I mean, you uh, also mentioned about this, this whole area of affordability from a farmer's point of view. And I'd just like to, you, you mentioned about the relationship uh, with China. Um, China are, you know, they're incredible about how they make decisions if they think something really works. So have you seen uh, an element of in-field transformation on integrated pest management techniques, the uptake of, of technology, as you say, uh, but also um, really the capability to, to try and drive change to avoid pollution and to improve human health? Yeah, definitely. I think... Uh... And that again, it's it's really interesting comment, Caroline, because there's an element of it's regulatory regulatory driven, but actually there's an element of it's customer driven as well and consumer driven. And something that's really important to all of us now is the environment and what we're doing and things like single use plastics and reducing single use plastics and reducing the effect we have on our carbon footprint on the on the land um, and as a result you know we at Syngenta are looking at at the moment uh, a sustainability project where we're looking at it, how you um, establish a crop no matter what type of crop it is but how you establish a crop over a prolonged period of time so over a full rotation of five years uh, what effect that has on on the soil and the environment itself so is that does it have a a positive carbon footprint does it have a negative carbon footprint um, and what does that do uh, for the soil health as well so we can look at we're doing things like uh, what's called the tea bag test which uh, which is you leave the tea bag in different cultivation matrices and see uh, how quickly it gets decomposed by the, the soil microbes um, and I think it's really important and I think it gives potentially a new out for growers where uh, if we're talking about premiums or end markets, my gut feel is at some stage uh, our consumers will be asking, well, what's the carbon footprint of this loaf of bread? And from a grower's point of view, if they can put that across effectively and reliably, that could be a really powerful tool. And I think it's something that we're looking at Syngenta with with establishment of crops, but also um, reducing the use of single use plastic, because obviously a lot of our products come in come in plastic. Um, and so we, we've started to integrate into a closed transfer system, which uh, is with five, five other manufacturers. Uh, and that is uh, going to ensure that operators get minimal exposure to product, but also that the cans they use can be fully recycled. And one thing that we've got to bear in mind is our products uh, are put into good 
plastic. So the plastic can get recycled into other good quality plastic as well. So it is definitely coming in into the field and it's definitely coming to our customers and consumers and, and they will start to see these changes very, very soon. Mm, no, I, I think you're right. And, and it's been extremely interesting, as you say, about the carbon one, though, if you remember in about 2004, there used to be carbon footprints on packets of crisps and things like that. But sometimes the actual embedded carbon weighs more than the actual packet of crisps, which from a consumer <laughs> perspective is quite a confusing uh, a sort of yeah. message. So whether it's going to be single issue, I, I personally doubt. But I think, as you say, there is so much public interest now in food and, and, and really driving climate positive and climate smart approach is absolutely key. Um, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but there were two sort of other areas that I did want to just pick up on. And, and one of them, uh, Murray, if I can sort of kick you off on this question, was, was about intellectual property. Um, and I think this is uh, one of the challenges in terms of as we see more generic pesticides, uh, from the pesticide, pesticide manufacturer's perspective, but also potentially from the information that is shared across farmers. And, and, and maybe, Harry, you've got comments on that particular area as well. Um, yes, sure, Caroline. So certainly from, from, from a point of view of the, the, the registration dossier for plant protection products, my area, perhaps of expertise, certainly the um, time frame for protecting data that is submitted to, to the authorities has been reduced under revisions to the current EU reg regulation. So that basically compresses the time in which manufacturers of novel and brand new pesticides have to, to regain that vast cost I mentioned in my slides. Um, it also means then that this whole uh, market for generic or off patent, we might call them out of protection pesticides, basically these include molecules that have been around for 10 years plus, perhaps, and a lot of the data that's been generated by the original uh, suppliers to market is now available to be referenced by those that wish, that wish to copy it. Um, that is fine, but it doesn't make for a very sustainable development of new pesticides coming in the marketplace. Um, that, that's sort of the regulatory uh, perspective on the comment, or my regulatory comment to what you mentioned. In terms of the consumer impact on that, I don't, don't know, Harry, do you have any comment perhaps on, on how you as to see the consumer uh, being made available, all this new information? And, yeah. the, and the farmer as well, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think um, from a cons consumer perspective, uh, I think it's one of those things that uh, we need to be careful about the information sharing because they... Uh, a lot of grow, a lot of customers and and uh, people who are buying food out of supermarkets um, don't necessarily want plant protection products to be used on any of their food. But they unfortunately, in order to produce the quantity that we produce, we need to do an element of it. And I think we need to be careful with that. And but the way we can do that is using um, things like Leaf, uh, the NFU, Red Tractor, those kind of. Uh, industry leading bodies that can prove when products have been used, they've been used effectively and safely. I think in terms of information sharing for, for farmers, they get so much given to them and, and shown to them and presented to them in, in formats like this, in PowerPoint, you know, um, and from their agronomist, from their machinery manufacturer, you know, there's so much stuff that goes, goes to them. And actually, I think a little bit of information sharing through farmers uh, you know, through forums and, and um, social media is really powerful and really, really useful. You know, uh, agricultural Twitter is is awash with uh, with information. And, and I think that's brilliant. And I think it's, it's really useful for our for our customers because they can get a good, concise, solid answer fairly and easily. And and uh, and we can support that with using uh, social media, with using apps and data to back up some of the um, the information that is, that is being shared with data. Because we can all give anecdotal information, but actually going exactly back to what Theresa was saying, reliability is what's important. Um, if we can be re reliable with our data sharing and, and the information that farmers get and share with the, with each other, that can only be beneficial for everyone. Yes, I, 
I though am reminded of a little saying where and you said a wash with information. So there's that better is that saying we're, we're drowning in information, but hungry for knowledge. And uh, you're right. It's uh, there is a lot of information out there. Um, but what's key is is the reliability. I mean, that is such a core part and, that, and access to that reliability. Thank you. Um, I am very conscious of time. Um, I would be very grateful now if all three of you could kind of sort of get that little nugget of information that you would like our audience to to go away with from what you have been talking about. And and just to, while you're you're finally thinking about that, um, you know, I, I'm reminded of the integrated pest management steps within our own integrated pest management strategy, which is aligned with the EU. And Harry, um, you mentioned that 25% of the EU will be organic by 2030. What that does mean is that 75% has potential to be integrated farm management and integrated pest management. I think that is the key of ensuring that at the end of the day, more sustainable farming approaches are not from one system alone. And that systems whole farm approach is something that's going to be very, very key. And I think, you know, the integrated pest management of crop protection areas does have to be about prevention and suppression, the importance of monitoring, monitoring decision based on both uh, thresholds and also that monitoring, non-chemical methods, the biologicals, the cultural and the physical, pest selection, the reduction in pesticide use and creating anti Pest resistant strategies as well as continue evaluating it. It is a continual cycle and it's something that's so, so key. So thank you very much indeed. And, and Teresa, can I have, as we, as we leave our audience, a final point from you, please? Well, I think you said it all, Caroline. I think I'll just reiterate what you said. I think from my journey so far, it's about embracing the future and embracing integrated pest management, thinking about that pyramid. Have you got that pyramid printed out and not just doing it because you have to, but actually can you start at the bottom and work your way up and, and take that to the fore? And I'd be pleased to share the case studies and the examples as we go forward um, and keep sharing that knowledge between us. Thank you. Murray. Caroline, yes, thank you. Uh, I guess my, my take home message, if we can call it that perhaps, is that certainly the, the UK, uh, the Great Britain, whilst uh, moving away from the EU plant protection product regulations, is going to have a very similar system. Uh, one could argue that ultimately the UK was key in developing the original plant protection product regulations uh, uh, way back in the 1990s, the early 90s. So effectively, the UK has always been one of the key member states in developing a scientifically robust strategy. Um, I think we will continue with that. And there is some challenges ahead in terms of making sure that the, uh, the regulations within Great Britain and uh, uh, the UK remain along the same timeline and the same conclusions to allow the free import and export of food. But effectively, uh, you know, farmers, growers in the industry, we used to change all of the time. Uh, Harry mentioned the weather. Things change every day. So I, I've no doubt that we, we shall manage. <laughs> Thank you so much. Harry. Yeah, so I think the take home message from, from my point of view would be um, adaptability is key and growers that can adapt to the situation, uh, be it the weather, which <laughs> seems to have come up a lot, or uh, their cropping regime or uh, their regulatory environment or their customer, if you can adapt to ensure that you maximize your potential within those situations and mitigate the risk factors that are taken into account with those uh, situations, you will do a good job as a grower. And I think uh, that is the best way to have a sustainable, prof profitable farm business. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, really rich discussion and uh, very informative speeches and talks. So thank you so much, Teresa, Murray and Harry. And indeed, a big thank you to our audience as well um, for posting your questions and taking part in the whole discussion today, too. So um, very much again, a big, big thank you. And back to you, Teresa.
Thanks, Caroline. What a fantastic session. I hope you enjoyed watching and remember, there's a lot more to see and watch in our virtual exhibition hall and hubs. This concludes this year's live CropTech seminar program. From myself and the rest of the CropTech team, we hope you've enjoyed the program and we very much hope to see you again in person next year.